Hello, I'm Neil Hamilton, the professor of law at Drake University in Des Moines and the director of the Agricultural Law Center. I want to welcome you to another installment in our series, Law for Landowners, 10 Things to Understand. Today our topic are 10 things to understand about the basics of American property law. Law students spend a whole semester studying property law but I think that we can at least learn the basics that we need to understand by considering these 10 different points. Our American approach to real property is based on the idea that individuals can have the exclusive right to own and to use property. This type of complete ownership is referred to as fee simple or fee simple ownership. Fee simple ownership is in contrast to forms of ownership where you have less of a complete interest. For example, if you lease property for a period, or let's say you have an easement to use another person's property. For example, you have a shared driveway with a neighbor. As we will discuss in another installment in this series, there are many other people who may have an interest in your property and how you use it. But today our focus is on what you need to understand about your rights as a property owner. Second, the most common way that lawyers think about property and law students learn it is to think about property rights as if they were a bundle of sticks. If you own all of the sticks in the bundle, then you're considered to have what we would call fee simple title. You have the right to own it, you have the right to lease it, you have the right to use it, you have all of those different types of ownership interests that go with what we think about as property owning. On the other hand, if you don't own the property in fee simple, but let's say you lease the property, well then another way of thinking about it is that you have uh, fewer of the sticks available. You have certain rights, for example, the right to exclude others, but you don't have the right to use the property for any longer than the period of your lease. Thinking of property rights as a bundle of sticks makes it easier for us to visualize how these sticks can be pulled out, sold to others, retired, transferred, or how they may differ between different types of property interests. Third, some property interests can be separated from the underlying fee or the title of the property. For example, you could grant an easement to a utility company to run a power line across your property. That interest is permanent, it's separated from the ownership, and uh, it is said to touch and concern and run with the land, which means it's not a personal agreement, but instead it becomes part of the actual legal title of the property. Farmland is considered to be real property, as opposed to, let's say, your tractor, which is personal property. The American courts have spent generations developing the special rules that apply when real property is concerned. A fourth point to remember is that one of those important rules concerning real property is that for any transaction or contract involving the transfer or an interest in real property to be affected, it has to be in writing. This is what's known as the statute of frauds. Oral agreements to sell someone a farm or to leave land to another uh, when you die will not be enforced by the courts because they aren't in writing. This is how the statute of frauds relates or applies to real property interests. The principle behind the statute of frauds is that if agreements involve things that are important, like the transfer of land, the parties need to reduce them to, to writing and to put their signatures to them, which is evidence of the agreement. The reason the rule is called the statute of frauds is because if the court allowed oral testimony about agreements, it would potentially induce people to make fraudulent or false claims to the court. And so the simple rule is, if it's important, put it in writing. If it's not in writing, it's not going to be enforced. One narrow exception to this rule is what's known as promissory estoppel. For example, if you can prove that you took action to det detrimentally rely on somebody's oral promise, you may be able to convince a court to enforce the agreement, even though nothing in writing existed. 
The fifth point to understand is there is one major exception to the statute of frauds, and that relates to leases that run for one year or less. As you may well know, many farm leases are oral agreements and they run for one year. These agreements do not violate the statute of frauds because of this exception. Now, as you may also know, many farm leases that are oral may run for many years, but it's important to remember that they run for a year and then they have continued under Iowa law that provides if notice isn't given by September 1st to terminate a lease, it continues. And so these leases are basically a series of one-year agreements. And it's that fact that they only run for one year that allows oral leases to get around the statute of frauds. On the other hand, if you had an oral agreement that was to allow you to lease a farm for five years, it most likely would not be enforceable. The important point to remember is if you have an agreement that involves real estate, get it in writing. Sixth point to understand is that American property law is based on the idea of written land records, which are recorded locally. In Iowa, these legal records are filed with the county recorder, who's responsible for maintaining uh, the records on the legal interest in real property. The records are tied to the legal description uh, for each piece of property, the type of descriptions you're familiar with, the northwest quarter of the northwest quarter of section 16, for example. When you buy land, what you're interested in is receiving a deed that shows that you have clear title to the property. Clear title means that no one else has a better claim. There are no other deeds that exist or outstanding mortgages or other interests that you aren't aware of so that in fact what you're obtaining from the buyer or what you may have inherited in the probating of an estate is known as a clear title, which is the most complete form of a fee simple title that you could obtain under our property system. Deeds are recorded at the county recorder's office and after a fee is paid, then they are filed on the books. It's the fact of filing these local land records which puts everyone else on notice of your claim. The seventh point to remember is that when property is sold or transferred, such as being probated in an estate, it's important that the land records are checked and are updated to make sure that any other interests that may have been recorded during this recent period of time are discovered. This process of examining the land records and bringing them up to date is known as preparing an abstract for the title. This process is accomplished by a title search or examining the land records so that anything that has been recorded can be discovered and added to the abstract. This abstracting process is typically done by lawyers or may be done by local title companies who are in the business of preparing abstracts and keeping records of the transactions that have been recorded with the county recorder. As I noted, buyers are going to want clear title, meaning that they aren't going to be interested in buying a piece of property that has other potential claims to it. Certain claims, such as a mortgage that may be found, can be satisfied by using some of the proceeds of the sale to satisfy the mortgage or to clear it. Other types of interest that may be discovered, for example, that easement to the utility company, can't be removed, but instead the process of doing the abstract makes it possible for the new purchaser to discover what other types of interest may exist in the records that they will be bound to once they become the owners. The eighth point to understand is that in the United States, property law is a matter of state law which means if you own property in Iowa, it's subject to the rules of real property law as established by the legislature and the Iowa courts. There is no federal property law, but instead, as I said, it is a state law question. There may be federal programs, such as the USDA conservation programs and farm 
payment programs which may affect property owners, but don't confuse those with the idea of property law, which is, again, an issue of state law. And it can vary by state. If you own land in Missouri, you may not be subject to exactly the same type of legal rules that you are as a landowner in Iowa. A ninth point to remember is getting back to this bundle of sticks, because it's important to recognize that there may be a, a wide variety of types of interests that are available in real property. For example, there was the easement that we could grant to someone else, right? Uh, there may be a lease that you could enter into. One thing to think about with a lease is while ownership may be for as long as you own it, a lease is going to be for a set period of time. So for example, the lease may really be a shorter right period or a shorter right that a landowner might have to the property. In addition, property may be owned in common. As I have said earlier, there may be a tenancy in common. You might have an undivided, equally shared interest with your siblings. Let's say there are three others of you, so you each have a one-quarter undivided possessory interest in the property. And so a way of thinking about that is that these sticks are similar and given to multiple people, all who own them at the same time. Another form of property interest that's very common is what's known as the life estate. This is where a person is given the ownership or the right to receive the income to the property for their lifetime, but once they die, the property passes to an identifiable and known person under the law referred to as the remainder. So for example, it might be common uh, between spouses that when one spouse dies, they leave a life estate in their property to the survivor, but then with the property to pass to their children at the death of the person who's known as the life tenant. It's important to remember that the life tenant may have what looks like the full rights of ownership, including the right to lease it, to receive the income, but the one right they don't have is to sell it, because all they have is the right to possess it during their lifetime. So again, that's really a way of thinking about a legal right that is shorter than if they owned it in fee simple. A tenth and final point to remember is that property law in the United States is very flexible. Under our law, there's what's known as the freedom of contract, meaning people can agree to do anything that is lawful, and as long as they are right, eligible to enter into contracts, meaning they aren't minors and they have legal capacity. When you think about that in relationship to real property, it means that people could basically agree to any form of transaction or even the separation of different types of legal interests as they see fit in their circumstances. Property law has been a very creative and fluid concept over time, and lawyers have been very successful in developing the type of property interests that allow the owners and others who are interested in property to achieve their goal. So even though property law is fairly complicated, I think we can summarize it by understanding some simple rules. First, you want to identify the type of legal interest that's involved. Is it a sale? Is it a lease? Is it some other type of transfer, for example, inheritance? Uh, second, you want to understand how the legal interest is being created or transferred. Third, you want to determine from whom the interest is being obtained and how the legal issues might come about. For example, is it a farm tenancy, so you have a landlord and tenant? Is it an issue involving a neighbor? Is it a probate issue that might involve the claim of other uh, potential inheritors or heirs? Fourth, you want to consider how the issue or transaction involved may impact your potential interest or rights as a landowner. Is someone trying to claim an interest in land that you think is yours? Is someone claiming that you're doing something with your property that is interfering with their legal rights? By following these basic steps, you may be in a better position to try to understand how the law applies to you, and you might be able to ask better questions of your attorney or the other officials who might be involved in the situation.